Whiteboard Podcast number two. We're uh, coming to you live from Irvine, California. Not live because it's being recorded, but it's live for us right now. So you get what I'm saying. Anyways, I'm here as always with uh, my co-host Brady and our producer Tyler. So this week we're talking about um, mitigating uh, post-termination claims, subrogation, and uh, we touch back in the primary threshold. We want to drive it home because it's so important. But uh, I think that's it. Let's get to it. And we're live. Episode two of the Whiteboard Podcast. We're going to be going over a lot of stuff today in a short amount of time. We're looking forward to it. I'm here, as always, with uh, Brady and Tyler. And um, I think the first place where I want to go with this is talk about um, something that happens to a ton of companies and it's post-termination claims. And these can be cumulative trauma, which they typically are. They can always be specific, and someone just didn't know they got hurt six months prior to them being terminated. But it's a major problem um, for a lot of companies that have these claims because after they're no longer employed at the company, a lot of the strategies that you can implement when it comes to return to work and salary continuation don't work. And so typically these claims are also litigated too. I mean, you could probably give a better answer to that going through what you're going through. is Almost all of them. Yeah. Like 90%? Yeah, vast majority. So, and how many claims out of 100 are post-termination, do you think? Um, Not nearly that many. I don't know. If I had to guess, 20, 30%. Okay, that's still a large. Yeah. I mean, that's a large <laughs> chunk of claims coming, and then virtually all those are litigated. Like these are major cost drivers to insurance companies and a major impact on our clients' premiums. So like that's this you, is something I'm very important. Or yeah, very you, important to talk you also about. see that they come in waves a lot. So once one of them does it, the other ones go, "Oh, we don't work here anymore. We can still get income, you know, some way." And then you have the same company experience post term claims at the same time for different people. Yeah, so that can happen with just termination with a few people. It can also happen with like mass layoffs. Yep which happens all the time. It's going to continue happening too. As automation moves forward, like employees are going to keep downsizing. Like minimum wage is going up. I think in LA it's $14 and 25 cents. And that's going up to $15 starting in July. So companies are going to look everywhere to where they can cut costs on labor. And so as that process continues to go out, all that's going to happen is, you know, more layoffs, more terminations like this. And so, it's an or like in order to be able to protect yourself as a business, you have to know all the strategy. You have to know the rules. You have to start preparing, um, you know, months in advance for layoffs to protect yourself. So, um, Brady, maybe you touch on. Yeah, I mean, we've been seeing this. How to do that? Even when I first started, and we would go out on meetings, people were seeing these from mass layoffs or just a few people who had a couple happen at a time. Um, so, fixing this has been a priority for us to figure out what to do. Um, we figured out that you should be documenting everything you can. So anything that you can get in writing instead of telling them, that's always better. Anything that you can get um, them to, to sign off on their acknowledgement, um, that helps too. So um, a few of the important things there would be regularly and, and regularly changes based on what you guys do for work. So um, a manual labor type of company, landscapers, painters, you know, they might do a weekly tailgate meeting. Other companies maybe once a month, once every two months, they have a company meeting. Um, but you have employees sign documentation, which will state that they haven't been injured, they haven't witnessed an injury, and that they're knowledgeable on how to file a claim or report even if they think they might have got hurt. Because what you have is they don't say it up front, and then they wait and they wait and they wait, and either post-term or just significantly later, they want to go back and say, yeah, I got hurt last September – and now it's too late to go back and investigate the claim, to deny the claim, to do any of the work that needs to be done in the front. Um, and it, it's too late at that point. So. And that's a big thing to know because we ran into this today actually with a claim. It's, um, I guess, management noticed a claim. Mm -hmm. When that's notified starts the 90-day rule. Yep. Um, so, so not just an owner, even if it's like a manager. Anybody in a managerial duty, perspective yeah. – if they get notified of a claim, that's when it triggers the 90 days. During that 90 days, it allows the insurance company to investigate the claim to see if it's going to be accepted or denied. After that 90 days, they're by law required to accept it. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I guess when you were going through that, the question I have 
is um, do you think that's going to raise any red flags to employees once you start throwing around, are you injured? Have you seen anybody being injured? Um, people have said that it does. I think a lot of it comes down to the framing. Uh, we do a lot of educating the employees on what actually happens when they file a claim, um, what they're doing to their employer and what alternatives they have, which a lot of them don't know about their alternative options either. Um, so it's important to make sure that they know, you know, if you're, you're doing this sign off when they're collecting their payroll or when they're, you know, turning in their timesheet or collecting a paycheck, then it kind of looks coerced. So you can't threaten, like you won't get your paycheck if you don't sign this off. So it has to be separate from collecting your paycheck. Yeah. It should be okay. more of a monthly meeting thing. Like, Hey, are any of you guys hurt? We want to get you the care you need. If you are, if you're not just, can we, you know, we're, we're putting this in your employee file saying that you weren't hurt this month. We're keeping a record. There's a way to do it where you won't get as much catch back. And if you do, maybe that employee has a reason to be suspicious. Sure. Too. It automatically triggers a red flag from the employer yeah. saying, is there a reason why this person's not signing it or anything like that? Are they planning something? So just to be more aware, mm -hmm. it's a big deal. And on that same note, we uh, suggest everybody document any behaviors that would lead to termination too. Um, if you're going to fire an employee and you just walk up to him and fire him, he doesn't have that income anymore. And one way that they might try to replace that is going back and filing a post-term claim. Um, so so you're you, talking about like constructive discharge, essentially. Make sure that you're firing them with cause and then make sure that you're documenting that cause. It's it's all This is all done proactively to prepare a case if they were to try to contest it later. Sure. So if they leave, they file a claim, you go, well, no, we let you go. And now you're filing this. You can deny it under the post-term defense, but then they can still take it to court and you've got to back it up. Sure. So if you have something that's saying, you know, they, they falsified timesheets, they were stealing from the break room, whatever, you know, those are noted along the way. They're signing off on the discipline for that along the way. And then you also have them saying that they weren't hurt along the way. That gets into the defense lawyer's hands and they've got a case. Gotcha. That's a really big deal. So yeah. it's that if Tommy came to work and he's been working there for two years and you have two years of documentation every two weeks that not mm -hmm. hurt, not hurt, not hurt. I know exactly how to um, report exactly. a claim. If not I just it. not hurt, but I knew what would I should do if I thought I might be hurt. Let sure. alone knew I was hurt, but yeah, yeah, the knowledge. So where we got some of this is from our, uh, I guess, our partnered law firm. Um, they shared a lot of this information. So while they're going through cases, they always come up against them. It's like, man, you should have gotten this. We should have gotten this. From now on, moving forward, you should be doing A, B, and C. And, like, that's where all this comes from is straight from the folks that are actually, like, defending you against litigated work comp cases. Mm -hmm. Yep, they uh, called it a slam dunk. If you have these things, then they've got what they need to, to get that case thrown out or dismissed at a nuisance value at most right away. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing that kind of ties in with those two things also is um, do your diligence as an employer too. So don't just be asking them if they're hurt. Don't just be having them sign these forms. If you notice somebody limping, if you notice somebody say to his buddy that his you know, elbow's been hurting while they're painting, whatever that may be, ask them. You know, hey, do you, do you want to get treatment for that? Do you want to go get it looked at? Um, if they say no, then they sign off on something refusing or, you know, saying that they don't need to go get care. Yeah. And then, you know, that can't come back and look like they notified you of a claim or you were aware of an injury that you didn't report. Sure. That makes sense. Um, those were kind of our overarching ideas. Um, specifically to those who do a mass layoff, we also talked to the defense counsel about giving them notice. So if you can tell them a couple months ahead of time, they have a chance to go find other jobs. They can start saving money, you know, being more responsible fiscally. And then they're going to have a less likely that they have a need to file a work comp claim to sure. make up for that income. That makes sense. This is a big one I want to touch on, the exit interviews. Yep. This is something that a lot of employers don't do, especially in the construction and manufacturing space. They just, it's typical layoffs. They're like, all right, you're laid off. Here's your last check. Mm -hmm. See you around. And a lot of pushback that I'll hear from clients is like, well, as soon as we fire someone, like it's either, you know, over text or a call or, you know, an email or something like that. Mm. Um, and even if we try to get them back in there for an exit interview, like most of them don't show up. Right. So um, what I've told a lot of my clients is like your job is to make sure they show up for that exit interview. So if that means like, hey, we want to give you a parting gift, even if it's on like bad terms and whether that's like a hundred dollar Amazon gift card or anything like that to say, Hey, it's important for our company to know like why this is happening, whether that's, you know, you're voluntarily leaving or 
we're terminating you. We want to make sure the company's protected and your time's valuable. So um, we want to make sure that we're going through the process. But that's the best way to do it is incentivize the, you know, terminated employee to get to that exit interview because a lot of stuff can happen right then. You can find out exactly what it is. You can get them to sign paperwork in regards to not being injured. Um, a whole bunch of stuff to help um, when that pushback comes back if they do end up filing a claim. Yep. Yeah, that was uh, made important by, you know, the defense counsel that we spoke to, too, that that just rounds out the slam dunk for them. So when all of that is there, then they're they're feeling good about going in, um, either dismissing that case up front or taking it to trial because they know they're going to win. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, another thing that is pretty impactful for claims that we need to talk about, and this also happens on post-termination. I saw this one for one of our landscape clients. They had a... Um, an auto accident where their employee got hit by another driver. And, um, three months later they fired that same employee and then post termination claim attached with a driving incident, um, where the other drivers at fault, not are insured, mm -hmm. but work comp is still paying out. And so, um, I want to talk about subrogation and how that ties into claim cost about the process that it will go down in regards to, when a claim happens, work comp is definitely paying out if your employee gets hit by another driver. And so a lot of folks are like pissed off for good reason. Like, hey, why is my insurance company paying out on something that wasn't my fault? You mm -hmm. know, and so um, the process and understanding about how subrogation works can definitely alleviate like a lot of stress on saying, well, yeah, your work comp's paying out, but there's a remedy for that um, to make sure that any debt that's been incurred or any costs that have been incurred, sorry, um, is being recouped by that insurance company. So it doesn't ding you. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Being new to claims, I saw subrogation thrown around. I knew it was a big legal term, but I didn't know exactly what it was or, you know, how we were going to use this. So, um, early on decided to look into it and specifically, uh, you know, the technical definition is that it's the assumption by a third party of another's legal right to collect a debt or damages. So even that's kind of technical. Um, we, we put up an example of this claim that you talked about to make it make a little bit more sense. Um, so essentially you have your employee driving, he's driving for work, so it's important that they're not you know driving off work because then it's not work comp. Um, they're sideswiped by another vehicle. Then that employee goes and sees a doctor and they refer them for more care. There's treatment to come along with that. And your workers' comp policy is going to pick up the claim. And they're going to start paying for treatment. So from there, the employee will to con continue to treat until they're healed for the injury. And then once healed, your workers' comp carrier is going to close out the claim. Hold on really quick. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So if they're just paying for treatment, who's paying for the lost wages? That's work comp too. Okay. Yeah. So work, okay. work comp is paying all the costs associated with the claim. Okay. Um, the, the lost wages are paid for while the treatment is still ongoing. So okay. future treatment at any time missed from work. Um, and then once the employee is healed, your work comp carrier is going to close out their claim file or, or mark the case as finished. And then they're going to go back and pursue subrogation against the other driver's auto policy. So that other driver was at fault. He's got car insurance or his business or, you know, whatever he was driving for has an auto policy. They go back to them. They say, hey, we've paid out the claim. It's this amount. And then the auto policy reimburses the work comp carrier for those costs. And that's including their treatment and the lost wages? Yes. Okay. That's a really important thing to know. And this is so one six of all drivers don't have insurance. Mm. And so if you really think oh, that's a crazy number, man, it's scary to actually think about because what that does is there's insurance for uninsured and underinsured motorists. Mm -hmm. And so that whole process about like, I just got hit by someone with no insurance. There's legitimately an insurance for that, for someone being a dirt bag, but that insurance company is going to go after them personally. And so any damages that were done to like the vehicle or property or anything like that and any medical treatment is done. So that can legitimately bankrupt you if you don't have insurance. So if you're one of those people driving around insurance, stop listening to this podcast right now <laughs> and go get it. Um, I guess the next piece to remember is limits on podcast or uh, <laughs> limits on um, your auto insurance as well. Mm. So there's a ton of company vehicles out there and a lot of these folks have like two or three people in the car. And so if you actually seriously, you know, injure those three people, you're not just paying for their treatment. You're not paying for the vehicle damage. You're now paying their lost wages. 
yeah. which on three people over a couple months is like, I mean, we know it is on work comp. Like that's insane. It'd be yeah. a ton of money. Yep. And once the important thing for the employer, so just, you know, anybody listening who's had a claim that needed to be subrogated or if you're thinking about it in the future, um, once that auto policy pays, the claim is removed from your work comp losses. So it's frustrating and we hear them all the time. You know, why are we paying for this? It was there at fault. They admitted they were at fault. They have insurance, but it doesn't immediately go to the auto policy. It's going to go through work comp, then work comp subrogates it back to the auto policy, and then it's pulled off your loss history. So Okay, so how that would work on for experience mods is let's say um, the claim happened two years ago. It finally just closed out, got subrogated. The bureau will retroactively go back, change their experience mod, having that claim been subrogated and have a claim cost removed. And mm -hmm. so they'll get money back for years of additional work comp premium. Yep. So subrogation is huge. And so that's why it's really important. So even if it's an auto claim or if one of your employees was um, out on a job site and let's say they're a landscaper and I don't know, they left something out that was being negligible. Like those are the type of things that we want to make sure that if work comp is picking it up and there was somebody else at fault that they're collecting money from that insurance company. Cause that happens too. We have a, we have a claim of travelers right now. Mm. And uh, one of their employees was um, working at in a parking garage, I believe. And it was um, dimly lit, it was dimly lit, which is seems like a long shot. Yeah. But if the place was required to have lights and it was an area where people could slip, like they're negligible. And so that whole work comp claim will get picked up by, I guess at this point, their client's GL policy, which it should, which would be a big help for them. I don't think it's going to. Really? Yeah. Hopefully it should. They The other people are stating that it wasn't that dimly lit. Now they're, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're arguing about how thing. much light there was. But then also they're saying that this employee tripped in the median between in a parking garage. You know how it's like raised, like where the curbs would be um, in a median that they cross every day, five days a week. So they're saying like they knew. It's a usual and customary there. that yeah, there's so. something there. We'll see. I mean, it's not over with yet. It's just not, a, you know, quite as much of a slam dunk as when somebody sw side swipes you in the car. Yeah. So. Well, the important part is, is like, we're trying to get that done. And they can do it in... Um, Partial? Yes. Okay. In, in yeah, they'll, they'll split the responsibility. So there is a chance that they get some back. Ne not necessarily all of them, Some but better than none, man. For sure. Yeah. If it's in their primary threshold. That's the move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which um, is where we're moving to. Yeah, so the primary threshold, we talk about this a bunch because it's the most important part about the claims process is understanding what part of the claim actually impacts your bottom line. And so the primary threshold is essentially a number that every single company gets here in California. It can range from $4,500 to $75,000 depending on your class codes, your payroll, and stuff like that. So what we want to do is make sure that um, whatever that primary threshold is, we are navigating our claims process around that number, meaning that we're putting all the effort into whatever that primary number is. And so, Brady, maybe you want to touch on, on why that's important to do and what the primary threshold actually is and how it impacts the premium. Yeah. So just like John said, it's a cap on the dollar amounts that will infect if affect your future X mod and your future premiums. Um, and the way it does that is different for every company and it's through your primary ratio. So that's a number. It's usually between three and five. We've seen it above 10 before. Um, but this is how much for every $1 on a claim you're going to pay back in the future. So uh, within your primary threshold, you have claims dollars, they carry or pays them out, and then you're going to pay your primary ratio back for every dollar. <clears throat> so if your primary ratio is four dollars and your carrier pays out a thousand dollars on a claim your future premiums are going to go up four thousand dollars okay over let, a three-year period let's do a quiz here someone's primary threshold is thirty thousand dollars a claim pays out um seventy five thousand mm. and um yeah and their primary ratio is four to one what is that going to pay out in regards? What are they going to owe back by way of their experience mod on premium? So the claim costs 75000 but their primary threshold is 30000 So it cuts it down to that cap of 30000 And then their primary ratio is 4.0. 
So you're going to do four times 30,000. They're going to pay out $120,000 over the next three years. Insane. Yep. It is crazy. I mean, it's a ton of money for those larger companies that have primary ratios. They're $75,000. I mean, every single claim is like potentially $300,000 in additional premium. And those large companies have a ton of claims. Yeah. So, so it's, it, it is important how big it gets, but it's also important to notice where those claim dollars are. And sure. We've talked about it before with clients as we're prospecting and, you know, talking to people through it. They're all in the front end of the claim. So I had another example prepared um, where the primary threshold, we're going to use 10,000 and the primary ratio is 4.0 again. Um, if you have an $8,000 claim, it's under the primary threshold. So multiplied by four, it costs $32,000. If you have a $15,000 claim, it comes down to the primary threshold, multiplied by four, <clears throat> it'll cost you $40,000. If you have a two hundred dollars or a $50,000 claim or one that goes way over, same thing, it comes back down to the cap, you multiply it by four, and it's going to cost you $40,000. So whether it's $15,000 or $215,000, it's going to be $40,000 in future premiums because of that threshold, and they're the first $15,000 on any claim. Yeah. So knowing what we know about the primary ratio and the primary threshold, we have this proactive approach to make sure that everything happens up front to steer it early. Because once yeah. those first dollars pay out, then it's too late. Yeah. So how do reserves factor into this? So let's say new example is there's a, they've paid out a thousand dollars and for a $10,000 primary and they have $20,000 on reserves. Mm. What are the steps and what are you like your thought process as you're going through a, like that type of claim? So the unit stat date is going to be important there. Um, once a year on your unit stat date, which is six months before your policy renews, your carrier submits all the information on your losses to the rating bureau who's going to come up with your experience mod. Um, so by the time your unit stat date happens, you need to handle the reserves as best you can um, because they'll hit you like actual losses. So if your unit stat date comes up, you've only paid out 1000 but there's 20000 in reserves, it's going to look like that $10,000 claim because it's going to go through the primary threshold. If the unit stat date is six months away and there's that many reserves, then our goal would be to follow up with the patient and with the doctor to make sure that those reserves continue to be lowered and we can get it back within the primaries to save those primary dollars. That makes sense. So another good thing to remember is even if that goes after your um, unit stat state, so let's say there's, a you know, mm -hmm. $8,000 paid out and still 5000 on reserve, and it goes over unit stats date, and then we get that claim closed for 8500 bucks all in. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a, like 30 to 60 days after, we can retroactively go back and have them take the, and revise their unit stats report. Which it, it has to be a certain amount of difference, right? Yes, it does. But it's that difference is not a ton. I think it's right. like 10%. Because that 10% is a ton of money. On a $10,000 claim, that's a $4,000 additional premium. So Right. Especially considering the ratio. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that's pretty much it that I wanted to go over today. Yeah. Unless you got something else. That was it. All right. two notes. Cool. Knocked it out. Thanks for listening, guys. Have a great weekend.